Um, so, Pavlo, take it away. Jupiter, this is Houston. Hey guys, good to see you all. Thank you for staying. Um, right, so uh, TLDR, what I'm going to talk today uh, is uh, on Bitly. Uh, talk hyphen to hyphen Jupiter. So there is an example. Okay. Right, so uh, the point of this slide is like, if we want to talk to Jupiter, there is no need to send an expensive rocket to Jupiter with I. Okay, so uh, w w what am I going on today? So, uh, Jupyter Notebooks, probably a lot of you use them, uh, and sometimes you probably have a use case where, okay, well, I have a Jupyter Notebook, but I want to modify a set of arguments and rerun it for a slightly different set of arguments and you end up creating a copy, like saving a copy of your notebook. So essentially when you have a, the same um, code base, but you want to rerun the same code with a different set of arguments. So at, uh, at the moment, uh, well, Jupyter Notebooks are not created as templates. They're not created as functions. It's not easy to um, inject arguments into them. So I'll uh, show you a way of doing that. Okay, so uh, if you Google the same question, how to run Jupyter Notebooks with arguments, uh, this kind of uh, JavaScript snippet comes up on Stack Overflow. It's good, it works in um, notebooks. It uh, does not work if you want to create a nice looking Jupyter dashboard. It does not work there because um, kernel is not accessible uh, through the JavaScript. Uh, but on the other hand, so this, this kind of snippet uh, can live in uh, custom JS if you want to use it. Um, well, but we do not have a problem, so there is a way. And uh, actually, uh, my slides are kind of meta slides because they are a notebook. They are the solution and also the slides. I'll actually, I'll show you. So this is the key. Better? Uh, can you see that? Uh, so this is the key part of the code. So uh, instead, what we want to do is we want to um, register a communication channel, so the JavaScript uh, uh, side of the notebook to start talking to the Python side. So for that, you need to, so there is a mechanism, you register a channel and you um, send a message from the JavaScript side and you register a handler on the Python side, and then you will receive the message. So in this case, what we're going to be sending in is the URL of the notebook, and if we can supply arguments to the URL, we can decode them and use them as uh, arguments. So demo time. Okay, so as I said, like this is the same notebook that I'm using, so uh, F11 to show you that's not visible, is it? So, but basically, there is a URL. So, um, uh, your notebook, and then I pass arguments saying items foo, comma, bar, comma, buzz, and I want to select um, some of them. So, let's see what that does. So, if I just go ahead and rerun this. Okay. So, um, this notebook does not do much, but what it does do is creates this multi-select widget. It gets the items from the URL, and it gets the selected values from the URL and selects this, uh, those items. Uh, this way you can pass, so let's, let's say if you run your notebooks for different regions, for different stocks, for different, um, whatever, uh, however you slice your data, this is the way how you can parameterize your Jupyter Notebooks. Don't make copies of your Jupyter Notebooks. Use this kind of approach. Um, so just to show that it actually works, I can select bar. Uh, yeah, it's fine. So this is what you would do if you want to select, let's say, different geography or different stocks. So here we go. And um, uh, we selected different items. So notebook is aware of what you want to achieve. All right, skip to the end. And this is the URL. Uh, 
Thank you. Okay, so it was a cool thing. Now we have to, yeah, Daniel Pope on the stage. And we need Pavel Shavchenko. There you go. Go prepare. We have not that much time left. So, well, as you can see, uh, how many of you were in yesterday lighting talks? Ooh. Okay, but no, that's cheating. How many of you ended to, uh, yesterday? Uh, okay. Now I see. So, well, uh, the one that were in yesterday Latin talk know me. I'm later. I present myself yesterday. But now I have another one, you know, because I thought that today you were going to be a lot of more, and I was kind of afraid. I took him just to sacrifice. So, you prepare? There you go. Um, so. Yeah. So I spoke earlier in the week about massages that we were doing uh, at the social uh, for the, for the Python, uh, in aid of the Python Software Foundation. Uh, if you were at the social, I probably spoke to you and uh, chugged to you. Chugging is the, the term uh, for charity mugging. Um, it's, uh, so I, I now have slides, so I can actually show you a picture of Rob Collins, who I mentioned died, sadly died last year. Um, people uh, last night were uh, you know, sometimes shared a few words with me about um, you know, their, their memories of, of Rob Collins. Um, here he is uh, massaging in 2013 in Florence. That's a chain massage, uh, advanced technique. Um, I did not want to give the impression that Harry Percival is dead. He is, as far as I know, alive. Um, I've, I've spoken to him this week, so he's, in fact, he's, he's, he's really healthy. Uh, <laughs> This is, this is him massaging last year. This is uh, the, in, um, in Bilbao. Um, and then this was last night. So uh, we had uh, uh, quite a parallel system of massaging going on. Um, and people said they were good massages, so, so that's great. Um, so how much did we raise? Drum roll. Well, 1,070 euros and 68 cents, and, I didn't put it on the slide, 20 Polish Zlotys. So. <laughs> um, so, uh, to change the subject and use some of the rest of my time, um, I am a hobbyist games programmer, um, and uh, for the past I think it's nine years I've been participating in a, a week-long Python games programming competition called Pi Week. Um, and you are challenged to come up with a game uh, in a week, exactly a week, on a theme that is given to you at the moment the contest starts uh, from scratch. And the majority of it has to be Python. Um, uh, if you were around on Monday, uh, or, and maybe Tuesday, uh, we learned at EuroPython this year that uh, somebody has done the work to uh, make Python a scripting language for the Godot engine and also the Unreal engine. So um, this upcoming competition in October, you would be able to use Unreal, which is amazing. So uh, thank you very much to the people who did that, whose names I forgot to put into my notes. Um, I will just, how much time have I got? Not long. Okay, um, uh, two minutes, that's loads. Uh, so I, I was going to show you a, uh, this is where I should have mirrored my displays. This is an entry that uh, I, uh, uh, I wrote for, the, this is my previous entry. It did, it did quite well, but it didn't win. So I'm, I'm looking for a win in, uh, in October. So if you want to, to uh, you know, compete with me, yeah, bring it, bring it. Uh, so this is a murder mystery set on an ocean liner. Uh, you sort of, uh, ooh, there's a corpse. Oh, uh, you can uh, sort of uh, explore the crime scene. Two glasses, what does that mean? Uh, and, uh, and then we can sort of go in.
so anyway, so uh, you, can, uh, you, can, you can download that on the Pi Week site and solve the mystery for yourself. Um, thank you. The award-winning Daniel Pope there. Can we have Pavel up to the stage? I feel like I should explain the pink hat. Several times during the week, people have asked me why am I wearing a pink hat? And the answer is that uh, I'm pretty much bald, and this is a really sunny country, and it's kind of embarrassing having a pink head instead of a pink hat. <laughs> and I thought it would make, people, make it easy for me to be recognized, but the problem is now when I take it off, nobody recognizes me. So I'm going to take it off now so you can all see the transformation, and then I don't have to wear it anymore, which would be nice. Sorry. It's me! <laughs> Ready? Go, Pavel. Can you see it, guys? <laughs> Hi, I'm Pavel. Um, I'm from Malta. And uh, please raise your hands if you're from Malta. Yeah, we have two people, three. All right. Now, another raise of hands if you've ever been to Malta. Okay, quite a few people. That's great. I'll give you a few more reasons to visit, if you like. So there's the other, uh, well, there was the other window, but we've got a few more uh, beautiful architecture, more beautiful architecture, a couple of beaches, and developers, well, Java programmers. So we're going to change that by helping Malta love Python. Woo. All right. So we've set up a Python user group, it's called PyMalta, and um, the goals are to bring uh, developers together, uh, act as a hub, we're going to do this by organizing meetups, social events, and uh, talks. We're going to grow our numbers by inviting users of other, other program languages and speakers from around the world, like yourselves. All right. So yeah, if you're interested in talking, please, uh, like speaking in Malta and visiting, so please talk to me after. But uh, if you are in Malta, please get in touch. And uh, these are our contacts. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Is Lucas Langa prepared? OK, go upstairs. And the Amsterdam Airport queue? I really hope it's just a part of the queue. We have not that big a stage. So OK, prepare. Um, He's, he's laughing, I don't know. <laughs> it's funny. Um, are you prepared? Lucas? Yeah. yeah. All right. We have no time. It's the last day. People are getting nervous. I can't. Aren't you? All right. I feel that you're a bit hungover to be nervous, but OK. OK. Hi, I am Lucas Lanka, and you are not running Python with warnings. You should be running uh, Python with warnings. So for the next five minutes, I'm going to be your mom. I'm going to be giving you a single piece of advice multiple times, and you're not going to get it. So I'm going to be bringing up like stuff from your past that would be so much better if you did listen to what your mom is saying, right? So you should put on your coat or you'll catch a cold. You should never climb trees or you're uh, going to fall off and break your neck. And you should be running Python with warnings enabled. Remember the time when you were hoarding files and never closing file descriptors? And then like your entire operating system is unhappy because you are using all the file handles and like everything went to shit. So that would totally not happen if you were running Python with warnings enabled because it would warn you, right? Remember when you were coding so hard, you know, focused on your creative aspect that you you know, you were using strings all wrong? Well, if you were using warnings with Python, that would never happen. You probably meant a raw string there, or maybe you misspelled an escape. Speaking of escapes, remember that one time that your escape plan turned out not to be as smart as you thought? Well, um, that would totally not happen if you were using warnings with Python. And in fact, at Facebook, some of HHVM's tests, integration tests, are in Python. Um, and this warning discovered invalid regular expressions that never matched. So there were unit tests that were doing nothing all this time. 
um, because people just knew like pro compatible, um, you know, regular expressions or whatever. So use this. Oh, and uh, remember that time when you were bitten by an unexpected bite? Yeah, so that would only not happen if, um, if you were using warnings with Python. So do that, right? When Instagram switched to Python 3, some of our code seemed to ignore configuration changes and we were super confused what's going on. So it turns out, USG returns any configuration parameters as bytes. So the check was always false due to mismatched types. That was the most expensive piece of uh, Python code that we had. But moving on, it's no longer 1999. Some of your favorite syntax, idioms, and APIs are deprecated and will get removed in future versions. Uh, versions. So you need to move on. You would be informed which ones those are if you were running with warnings. And to finish it off, like remember that time when you failed to kill an orphan? Well, that turned nasty, didn't it, right? It's like a lot of wasted resources, sleepless nights. Like, that would totally not happen if you were using warnings with Python. So I could just go on and go on and go on. Uh, but if I didn't convince you by now, like, uh, it's sort of hopeless, right? So at least do it during unit tests. WD, print the first occurrence of any matching warning for each location where the warning is issued. Dash B prints the first occurrence of bytes warnings for each location where the warnings are issued. And you're thinking, yeah, but I still live in the past. Well, you can still run with warnings. Um, there, you have to do something else, like which is dash T, which is warnings for tabulations and spaces, whatever. And obviously, dash 3, which means I really want to switch to Python, but I don't know what will break. So please, as your mom, like, use warnings with Python. Thank you very much. Can we have? Uh, yeah, we need the Amsterdam Airport queue to go on a stage and Roberto Martinez. Where are you, Roberto? Okay, just go and prepare. Okay. Wukash, you just spoke, looks young and handsome. But, uh, he I'm does? A, I'm a, I think so. Oh, cool. <laughs> I met, I, but, but, but I met him eight years ago at Europython. Yeah, then it has to be young, yeah, you know. He's older than he looks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, you ready? Almost. Almost? Really? Seems so. <laughs> okay, I'm not judging no one, so... Okay. If you don't need the slides, you can uh, do without them, too. Is someone that ha is going to make a um, lighting talk without slides? Think about it. You'll get like up in the list. Okay. No. Nope. No. Nope. Really? Everybody no, needs no, their slides. Go, let's go. Ah. You have slides. Ah, okay. You computer people. Well, if you if, if the Roberto is prepared, maybe we can just, because we can stay waiting for a long time. We need to close to your Python. I know, yeah. you want to stay. I know that you want to stay forever, but we have to end sometimes. I'm count you down from we five. need to sleep. The organization needs to sleep sometimes. Count them down from five. Five, four, four three, three, two, two one. one. Uh -huh. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Thanks for trying. We've got too many talks to get through, I'm afraid. Um, so, so, Roberto, Roberto, are you there? Can we get the next speaker? This is uh, Macchio. Um, up to just kind of stand next to the stage, that'd be good. Are you there, Macchio? Yes. Oh, okay. Did I pronounce He's it correctly? Here. Yes. yes. Cool. And now we start game. Yeah, the HTM dot. Okay, really, you can maybe do it with those slides. I can let you the, the Python if you need it to a puppet show or something. Nope. It's just like they don't want. I love how in these kind of places you see a problem and there are like lots of people just trying to fix it. But no one's here. You are like throwing ideas. 
Wow, this is awkward. Um. Yeah, I don't have it. He hasn't got HDMI on the laptop. Okay, I think I'm afraid we're going to have to give up on this one as well. Uh, Don't worry, we're not going to run out of speakers. Thank you for trying. Can we have a round of applause, please? <laughs> this is actually my eighth Europython in nine years. See, I'm older than Lilac as well. Oh. No. So you're like from so the dinosaurs and that kind of things. No, uh -huh. cool. I've been coming since Birmingham. Yeah. So I, I originally went to Europython because it was in the UK and it was cheap. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Yes. Take it away. Okay. Who likes threading in Python? Quite a few people. Who likes the global interpreter log? Hi. <laughs> I don't like the inter global interpreter lock, so we removed it. Uh, now what? Uh, turns out it's not that simple. We need to think about language semantics, because right now we have language semantics of C. If you write threads that clash, you segfold. Not great. Uh, we need to think about the multi-threaded performance, which requires a little bit of thinking. We need to think about multi-threaded tools. Uh, so. Just because you have race condition doesn't mean it cannot be debugged. PDB right now would happily stop one thread and let everything else go, which is not always a desired behavior. So those are the things that still need to be done after we remove the gill. We need to think about CPython C extension modules, which we support in PyPy these days. Uh, and that probably requires an extra lock and a bit of thinking here and there. So we are looking to raise $50,000. We already have some pledges to remove the gill and pie pie. Uh, and that was a very quick lightning talk. Thank you very much. Thank you for being that sort of time. OK, then now Nicholas, Nicholas Main, sir? Where are you? Well, get prepared. Um, um, sorry. Christian, brother, who has no slides, is going to give us a super awesome talk. Hey, now, what do you have to do to give great talks at EuroPython conferences? There's an easy recipe. First, give a lot of talks, and second, get them evaluated. This is why we have the talk feedback here. Over the past few years, I had the opportunity to actually actively evaluate 500 talks. 200 of these were on data science that I did for clients. 100, they were talks I gave at public speaking clubs. 100 at international speech contests. And 100 were my own talks that I got evaluations to. And I made a couple of observations. Number one is that usually structure beats the slides. So if you are preparing a talk, try to focus on making a, your structure very clear, having three to six main points, not more. Having a slide deck is not a structure. Second, Story beats CV. A story can something, be something very simple. For instance, a claim like, let's see whether we can get this Python package installed in five minutes, makes a story. It's much better than starting a presentation with a little bit about myself. Number three, take away value beats completeness. Usually, your audience won't know what you did not talk about. Nobody is claiming to say everything in five minutes. I have the feeling that improving our speaking skills is something that is worth doing in order to have better conferences in the future. And this is why I started collecting 
materials to make speaking workshops, speaking clubs, events on to improve our speaking skills. And you find them on Google if you type speech underscore projects. I repeat, speech underscore projects. It's on GitHub. Contributions are welcome. Thank you. So, Niklas, can you go up? And, and Mike Muller, where are you? Okay, come here and prepare yourself. I really hope that you get the message from the talk we have just had. You know, no slides, more time. And there we go. All right, thank you. Hello. Um, let's talk a bit about TDD. Uh, three years ago, I went to a conference called EuroPython. At the time, it was in Berlin, and there was a keynote actually about the topic. Um, uh, will I still be able to get a job in 2024 uh, if I still don't do TDD? Right. So this year I'm again at EuroPython, and there seems to be, in, I, I didn't see any talks about uh, TDD in, in, um, in particular. There's a lot of uh, talks about testing frameworks and other uh, techniques um, for testing stuff. So I wanted to find out, is it just uh, because everybody is doing it, or why is nobody talking about it anymore? So uh, if you would help me out, um, I would put up two statements, and if you would uh, agree that this statement is true about yourself, just raise your hand, right? Uh, I use TDD. Okay, see, so almost, no, 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 please leave them up, please leave them up. Okay, that's, uh, hmm, yeah, not everyone. Please leave the hands up still, and um, just uh, take them down again if you don't agree with the next statement. And the next statement is, uh, when I implement a new feature, fix a bug, I write the test first. So I don't see that many hands going down, but some. Okay. So this, um, this is a bit interesting. Um, quite often you see people, um, you know, they tell you, oh, yeah, I'm doing, I'm doing test-driven. And um, then you say, oh, cool, and so how is this new feature coming? Um, oh, yeah, it's, it's just, it's, it's, it's all done. I just need to, to write the test, you know? So this leaves me confused. Um, <laughs> Because you're not doing test-driven development, you're doing uh, development-driven testing, or testing, really. Uh, it's still good. I mean, you still have the unit tests in the end, but it's not really helping uh, your development. So yeah, just, I just wanted to um, quickly do, a, I guess, a crash course of test-driven development, so that we're all on the same page again. Right, you want to do a new feature. You don't really know how it uh, will look in the end, but you know what it should do. So the first thing that I do, um, I sit down and I think really hard about the tests. And I want to define the tests so that they really fit what, what I want the feature to, to do in the end, and they rule out all the things that I don't want it to do. Uh, and then I just go uh, and shut the, uh, my, like, the half of my brain off and um, think about what I'm going to have to dinner and just develop on. And I, mean, I know if the test pass, I'm probably done. So last year, I went to Australia, and they have a thing, and maybe I can just use it. Uh, so I run the tests, and it doesn't work. Ah, it, because the metal things, they, they need to re-round, right? OK, so, so I do, do another thing. Uh, still doesn't work. OK, hmm, now I need to get creative, do something else. Um, it looks interesting, I guess, but um, the tests still don't run. OK, hmm, I get crazy. Um, I have low blood sugar now, I'm hungry, so I do a thing and, uh, what? what's that even? I don't know. <sighs> okay, test still on. Okay, at this point I need to take a break, obviously. So I take a break, have a coffee, come back, think about it a bit, and I come up with this thing, and yay, the, th the tests work. So I'm done. Cool. Test driven development. Um, so, yeah, test driven development. Uh, if, if, if the tests pass, uh, the app works correctly, right? Uh, that's not quite case. So, yeah. Remember, the uh, tests have to, be, uh, have to be good. So the tests are really the thing that you need to concentrate hard on, write good tests, and then, yeah, and then do the development. So remember, write tests, shut half of your brain up, uh, develop on something, and profit. Thank you. Cool. So, Mike Muller, are you and Alexandra Muller? Where are you? 
Where are you? Okay, there. So come here and prepare. This will be quick. Mike's a pro. <laughs> there we go. Okay, there we go. You're a sci-fi. Hello. So you're all at a conference, uh, but there are more Python conferences than just EuroPython. And I would like to introduce your SciPy 2017, which is only a few weeks ahead. Actually, we have an anniversary. It will be our 10th edition. So this will be a very special conference. Um, it will be in Erlangen, Germany, at the university. And we have a full week. So we'll start August 28th, and we finish September 1st. Uh, the conference has two days of tutorials, so we typically have a beginner's track and advanced track, and we, we often have authors of open source library introducing things like NumPy, Pandas, and many other scientific libraries. Uh, these two days are followed by two days of talks, and we have presentations, but also have posters, so if you would like, you can also present a poster. And finally, on Friday, we have a sprint, and we sprint on scientific libraries, obviously. So a registration is open, so if you would like to come, please register now. You can find more information at this link, as you can see down there, your SciPy Org 2017. We have a lot of topics, so we cover pretty much everything that has to do with something to do with Python and scientific computing, array computations, parallel computation, uh, computations, visualizations, data flow kind of things, but also something about the scientific Python community and everything, general purpose tools that can be used for science too. So if you're a web programmer and you want to present something that can be used for scientists, you can also do this there. Of course, we talk about algorithms and other topics that are related to Python science. Uh, the pop, the pro program will be published soon. That we are currently in the phase of uh, reviewing the, the, uh, the proposals. So we have quite a few proposals. And we are heavily working on the program. We also have a very interesting keynote. So Yuli Aurora will talk about how to fix a scientific culture. So if you want to have more details, please go to the website. And you can also become a sponsor. So if you would like to support the scientific Python community, please talk to me or send us an email. And you can reach uh, the scientific Python users in Europe. And the only thing now that's left over is you have to come to the Python EuroSciPy conference. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry. Would you, uh, if you just wait there. OK, take it away. Hello. Um, <laughs> I want to talk a bit about how the cultural background affects our uh, perception of music. I have um, dealt with this topic in this last year for a project for my school. And for that, I've made a survey. So here, you can see a scale. Um, I use the scale to represent the music in different cultures. This I transformed into something you can hear, and I use this table here. And these are the frequencies for each note. I used this program Audacity and made these scales for you. They might look like blue boxes, but actually, if you zoom in, you'll see this. OK, they might look like lines now, but if you zoom in further, you'll see this, it's, which is quite typical for a sound, if it's a clear note. So I made these sounds, and I still needed more for my survey. I had to decide if I wanted to take that picture of the world or that picture of the world. I decided if, um, to take the second one, so the bottom one. And I also found out that Google had this if, knew the colors like this. And of course, I knew that was wrong. And after trying and trying, I finally got a survey that looks like this. Um, I would ask you to please take part in this survey and ask all your friends to take part as well. Here's the link. Thank you.
Who's enjoying the lightning talks? Make some noise. So technically, we only have time for this next talk uh, before the closing statement. Uh, but we can stretch another 15 minutes, maybe get another three talks in after this. Who's up for that? Yeah? OK, awesome. In that case, uh, I have to look down the list. Uh, yeah, can Martin? Oh, there is there Martin somewhere? Cool. Just get uh, prepared. And we'll give Daria a few seconds, actually. Oh, no, it's not working. Uh, also, yeah. The title of the talk was, We Have No More Jokes About, pi about Peace. Cool. <laughs> I'm not sure if this is a good or a bad new, actually. I think that she took uh, like really hard the thing about the 15 minutes. You, yeah, this is working. Cool. No, it was just for getting your hopes up. It's not actually working. Sorry. Uh, also, Anton Cáceres. It's going to be not the next, but the next. So, oh, there you are. Cool. I think this is where we're supposed to make a joke about Linux on the desktop. Yeah, we should, but you know, when Harald gave this talk... <laughs> really? When Harald did this talk, the desktops were like photos. We only get the yeah. default one. No, it's just a default wallpaper. It's very disappointing. Okay. We cannot give you more, much more seconds. So close. Yeah. It was like getting closer and closer. No. Uh, is anyone more that can give the talk without the slides? Maybe you, Daria? Hmm? Can go give the Daria? Can you give the talk without slides? No. Okay. Okay. So oh, then, yeah, Martin, Round of applause, go please. Up. It's like more pressure. Yay! Okay, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Ramon. I'm Rook. And we both uh, work at Amsterdam Airport Schiphol. Uh, at Amsterdam Airport Schiphol, we really like Python. We're working a lot with it. Uh, a lot of our models run it. Uh, we do a lot of analysis with it. Um, but we're looking for more people in the aviation industry that also like using Python. Um, so in order to achieve that, uh, we, uh, yeah, in order to kickstart that, we, we created a tool which solves a problem which is probably common for many people uh, working in the aviation industry. Uh, because whenever I want to do an analysis, I ask a, a partner or a carrier, like, what are your plans? And they give me their schedule for the year in a very sadistic file format, uh, where my colleague Rock and I have developed a solution for. Yeah. So, uh, as you can see, the, the flight industry started uh, in the 30s. And to, scale, to kind of sync the state of which flight is coming where at what time, uh, they started first working with uh, teletype writers. Unfortunately, the slide is missing. And the format looked like this. So you see it's a, like a magical string that says something about something that will happen. Now, so, sorry? Oh, yeah. There we go. Yeah, so um, since the 30s, much time has passed, uh, but uh, the only things that changed were that now there's a biannual conference at which they sync their slots. There's also email and some API calls. Uh, there was 140 conferences already so far, so think about that. And uh, the, the format is still the same. Uh, so, so this is the explanation of the format. Uh, we start with the action code. Is it visible? Yeah. So uh, this means we add a new flight. It, this is the flight number. This is the period in which the flight will go. This is the periodicity of the flight. So this means it will only go on Saturdays. 
Uh, it will have 150 seats and it will be uh, an Airbus 319. Uh, it will go at noon uh, to Linz and it's a, a charter. So you see like a human readable, very condensed format, perfect if you're using Telegram, the, the old one, not the new one. Yeah. So uh, this is passed around as SIR files and this is how they look like. So we have a header uh, and then we have the, the kind of the, the description of one flight. Uh, so this is uh, called a slot. Actually, a f uh, slot is composed of multiple flights sometimes. So what about this uh, slot we showed? So we can read it with R2. Uh, it's on PyPy, so you can use it. Um, we, we read it uh, from, the, from the disk, and we, get, we see that there is one slot in there. Uh, the header looks like this, the, the slot itself looks like that. Great, but how many flights is this? Well, we can expand it, and this is actually 10 flights. Uh, yeah, fine. Uh, so what about the real use case? So let's take summer schedule of 2017 for Amsterdam. Uh, we see that there is 20,000 about uh, slots, and there's even a warning, because uh, Transavia likes to put uh, 2400 instead of 0000 for their time. I don't know why. Um, okay, and now we can exp uh, expand these slots into flights, and we see that in about four seconds, slots into 300,000 flights. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you all for listening. This tool is available. You can you can pip install this tool. You can uh, clone it at GitHub. Um, and please tell all your friends in the aviation industry because I can imagine that you're not all using SIR files at the moment. But please, anyone you know, tell them about this and I hope we can get a good cooperation within the aviation industry for Python. Okay, cool. So now uh, Daria's coming again. Um, let's see if we can do this fast this time. Anton, you're prepared? Cool. Um, the next one is Jao Junior. Oh, and yeah, you were Roberto? Yeah, okay. So this time you think it will work? I go to the stage. Okay, then you're next. <laughs> there we go. Uh, Bonasera, Europython. First of all, I would like to thank you very much to come into Europython. I met some of them last two years, and I'm very happy to see you again here. But in some coffee breaks, I met guys that said it's the first time here. So I would like to hand a like, huge hand to them because it's their first ever Europython. So I would, I would like to invite you to PEACE. This is a conference. So the first conference was in 2014. And in that edition, we made the PyJog. And you can install them. People install PyJogs. But the problem is that we don't have more jokes about PEACE. So please come and help us. Um, why? Uh, what does it as? In, in our name. So we don't pronounce it by SS, we say peace. And um, it's because of the speakers. So this time we invite Jessica McKellar, that it's very nice open source uh, software developer, or Peter Wang, that it's very famous guy from uh, Continuum Analytics, some probably not very known person, uh, Guillaume Baron. But it's about aerospace. It will be cool talk. And we will have two uh, social events. And it will be Pinchos, as most of you know. <laughs> and Cider House. And of course, we have beach. And we have three of them. And it's the best beaches of the Europe. And it's very well known of the food and uh, very happy people and very calm and friendly. So um, please come to our conference. It's on the 6th from 8th of October. The call of proposal is open. 
and it will be first day, it will be tutorials, and it will be for free, and then uh, two days a weekend, it will be talks. Um, and then come and to peace. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Daria. Now, yeah, Martin. Martin, there you go. So how are we going to, with the time? How are we doing? I think we've got 10 minutes left, so we may be able Yay. to get talks. Yep. So you heard that, Martin. And now the cable wanted to work. Yeah, probably. So there we go. Yeah. Oh, what's that? It's a bear. A bear, really? In a Python conference? <laughs> you have to learn about context. There we go. Introduction of mocking. So, hey everyone. I am Martin Angiouf. I love Python and Django. I am currently working at Hacksoft, which is situated in Bulgaria. Um, such a beautiful country. I am also a software engineer studying, uh, student in software universities in Bulgaria too. And before we start, I want to ask you uh, how many of you have written unit tests? Great. So what's unit testing? It's, a, it's, it's actually a test methodology that allows you to, to write your, uh, to test your code and small piece of it. Um, and it, has, it actually has five principles known as first, which stays for fast, isolated, repeatable, and self-validating, and timely. So you have to write your, uh, which actually head us into some problems. Um, <clears throat> how many of you have written function like this? A function that calls an R function, which actually is pretty hard to test because um, you can't isolate it. And something like this, you import a function from a model and call it in your function, and you have to test, to, to test your function, which actually breaks these principles. And the solution for these problem, problems are mocking. Uh, what's actually mocking? How many of you know? Great. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, mocking is actually a test technique that allows you to um, fake your functions. And by faking your functions, I mean you can manipulate your, the return value of the function and also uh, the side effects, like raising an, ex an exception and things like that. Um, I prepared an ex a simple example which to me, it clearly represents my thoughts. Um, I have such a small function that just tells me if it's the summer. Um, so I'm importing daytime from the daytime model to get the now. So this means that my, if I don't mock the get now, my function, uh, my test will only pass if it's August, or it's July or June. So I have to mock it, and it's, that, it's uh, pretty easy to do so, like in the following tests. Uh, here I'm just patching the call. That's the most important thing. Uh, to me, such a confusing thing in my first mocks, um, because first I mocked the, the function, which is incorrect. You have to mock its call. And it's simply done by decorating your function. And after that, you can see what the return value of your mock is. So congratulations. You just mock the present. Yeah, and thank you very much. If we could have the next speaker to the stage. Anton, you on stage? Yep. And we need Joao Jr. Okay. Um, yeah. Cool. Mocking's difficult. Who would have thought you could teach it in five minutes? Actually, it was four minutes. 
Oh, four That's minutes. Right, yes. Good on you. Are you prepared? Nice mountains. You. Yep. It seems like there's something there. And um, yeah. You ready? Yes. <laughs> there we go. Hey everyone, cool to see you. I want to invite you to PyCon Web, and instead of talking, I'll just show it. idea to have a Python conference that is dedicated just to web programming. This is the first conference I know of where it has been focused just on the web and what a great idea that is. And I think this is a really great opportunity to bring people from the Python community together to discuss this particular topic of Python on the web without being isolated into our Django or clone or other little communities but instead sharing what we have in common. Great job, PyCon Web organizing team. It's great to be here in sunny Munich. Beautiful weather, beautiful people. Great to see all the new energy combining with these committed developers uh, interested in learning more about Python. Nowadays, technology is not one isolated thing, and so the PyCon Web is. We've built this diverse community by combining professionals and beginners to share the knowledge, to be inspired. It's really, really cool. There are a lot of exciting developments that are happening within web technologies these days. If you have the opportunity, come down. Is this cool? What do you think? Thank you. End of May next year in Munich. I hope to see you. Very cool. Can we have our final speaker of the evening, please? Speaker. I'm pretty sure the video wasn't made today. You know, like the lighting talks are supposed to do in the same day, but I'm pretty, pretty sure that that video wasn't. <laughs> Just suspicion. So are you ready? Yeah. No. Maybe. Give me feedback. <laughs> no, nothing. OK, this is going to be the last speaker, and then we're having a, the closing session. So sorry about, well, it was more than half of the list. So we can be pretty proud of ourselves. You <laughs> OK, you ready? You, we can see the slides. So. Yeah. Presentation here. There we go. Okay. Uh, I, uh, we come here to invite you to go to Brazil uh, to next conference, the main conference in Brazil. Have a lot of reasons to go there. This is in my city, Belo Horizonte. The first reason is about the event of Python. The second reason, this is Belo Horizonte is the capital of bars and beers in Brazil. And the, for Germ German people, have a special uh, reason that the, is bad for Brazil. In the city, the last World Cup, Brazil lost for Germany by 7-1, and it is not good for Brazilian people. Uh, in, the, in Brazilian people, we have uh, a, gr a great and a strong community, and a lot of um, pilots and jungle girls uh, that is very uh, special from Brazil. The conference in Brazil, uh, the Python, is not only about the technology, it is about the people too. It is very strong in, in our community. Uh, yeah, so last year, this was a picture of our conference last year that was held in Florianopolis, and we had 17 activities uh, there between talks and tutorials that were presented by women, by our pie ladies. And this year, 
we have 29 activities submitted and we are hoping to beat that number this year with a lot of girls uh, talking and giving tutorial besides all the Jungle Girls events that are happening in Brazil right now. Uh, probably, do you know from Brazil the Luciano Ramalho, that is author of the Fluent Python, and the Fernando Massanori, that is a big profession, and he already speaks around the world about Python. Uh, and here we can see about the, the many uh, events of Python in Brazil, uh, because Python is very strong, the community in Brazil. Uh, here is only the main conferences uh, in Brazil, don't have about the meetup and the another Django Girls and the another event. Uh, and here is the number about the conference when it starts in Brazil. And the, in this year, we wait about 600 persons. I'd like to invite you to go there. Thank you. So we're just stopping the lighting talks now and I think the people have spoken. Okay. Amazing. He says two it's minutes. just a popular demand, but <laughs> we're just uh, leaving him on a stage because you are quite uh, from here. You are quite intimidating. You are a lot of there's a lot of you screaming, and it's like oh, okay. So yeah. the title of this talk is how to get your pants stolen at Europe. I hope that's American pants. But, but he hasn't. I hope that's American pants, not British pants. Oh. Losing oh. British pants is much more rude. Really? <laughs> <laughs> so. Thank you, guys. So um, I had this kind of uh, strange thing happening to me. I wanted to share and raise the knowledge about some dangerous things happening in Rimini. So basically, what I wanted to do, I just wanted to have fun at the social event. I came there, I met a lot of interesting people. The event was actually really, really cool, thanks to the organizers. And credits for the photos to Alessia, the photographer. Yeah, so the event was really nice. Uh, this is kind of a representation of me having fun at this event. Yeah, by the way, the pants were white. So then I decided to go to the beach because I met a really nice person and we decided to have a swim. And what happened then? The robbers came and take our stuff. And when we came to see what's happening, this is what we did. And well, yeah, honestly, I really had to walk without my pants uh, to my hotel. <laughs> so some lessons learned. First of all, drink responsibly. Don't come up with crazy ideas. Keep in mind that it might not be that safe during the night. Thank you for the attention. If somebody wants to support me somehow, you can talk to me right after the event. Okay, can we have a round of applause for all of our speakers this evening?